talking about trusting today. And when you go to a foreign country, you leave your homeland, the safety and security of your homeland, you really have to trust the Lord, right? It's, it's a big step of faith just to do that. Um, and so there was a lot of things that we had to trust the Lord for. And one of them was COVID test. We had to have a COVID test before we left and it had to be negative. And for me, you know, I'm within the, the 90 days of having COVID. So my tests could, could be positive. Um, even though I'm not infectious, I, have, I run that risk. And so I just had to trust the Lord. You know what? I believe my test is gonna be negative. I'm gonna get to go because you've called me to go. And, and it was negative. And in returning as well, I could have a positive test and be stuck in Egypt for 14 more days. But the Lord, you know, was faithful and I just trusted him and I didn't worry about it. And that's what I, one of the things that, you know, I sense that the Lord wants us to really grab a hold of is not worrying about things, not stressing about things, but trusting him, putting it in his hands and say, I trust you with this, Lord. And that's the question you have to ask yourself. Do I trust him or not? In all things. Um, in this trip, that was one of the things. And, and, and we'll, I'll get into more of that when we get to spend more time speaking about it. But when I was preparing for today, I just felt the Lord saying this to us. And I, I, you know, I think this is not just for our church, but for the church in general, American church, global church, that God is calling his people, that this is a season of leaving everything behind and following me. The recognition of the things that we hold on to that we think are so important, letting them go, you know, is what I sense there. Leave it behind, because what you're holding on to does not bring forth salvation. It's not that important. It may provide comfort, it may bring temporary satisfaction, but there will always be another good cause you want to see get the victory, another fight you want to win here on this earth. And I talked about this last time I spoke about the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this earth, and how strongly are we fighting, you know, fighting for things that are really part of the kingdom of the world, not to uh, promote the kingdom of God. And I just felt the Lord saying, you know, again, I ask you, are you fighting for the kingdom of God, my kingdom, or are you fighting for this world? I am asking you to be stripped of this world. I have shaken you, and yet you still hold firmly to your will and your rights. My son, Jesus, did not fight in the manner in which you are fighting. He fought for my kingdom to come forth and he did it by listening to my voice. We know Jesus did nothing, said nothing, unless the Father told him to do it or told him to say it, right? That's how he lived his life. Speaking and acting only when I asked him to, I long for a church that is willing to completely surrender and bring forth my kingdom as it is in heaven. And you know, some scriptures that go along with that, Luke 9, 23, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. All right? Uh, Exodus 34, 14, for you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And when that which we give our attention to the most becomes a God in our life. And so God is calling us to leave that behind Turn off the YouTube channels, turn off the Netflix, turn off whatever it is that holds you. And, and I think we've all been there in a place where we find comfort in these things and we, we spend a lot of time. I know I have. But God is calling us to be set apart from that because it, it's, it's time that we should be pursuing things for his kingdom, his kingdom. We can't serve two masters. Our guidance for our life must come from God and God alone. So the question you ask yourself is, who is directing your thoughts? Who is directing your actions? And the, the answer should be the Lord, not the voices of others. And one of the lion bites that I recently had, lion bite is the prophetic word from the Global Prophetic Alliance, and I, and I like to look at what they are. And, and this one was, these are days of accelerated change. Who will step out of the busyness of routine and away from the noise of the world to listen and partner with the still, small voice of power 
and might. Step into the sound of the kingdom. The sound of the kingdom of God is the still, small voice of the Lord. We know this um, in 1 Kings 19, 11, and 12 with Elijah looking for the Lord. He wasn't in the, the mighty wind that crushed the rocks. He wasn't in the, er the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. All these amazing things that look very powerful and capture our attention. But no, he was in the, in the, the whisper, the still, small voice. So it means we have to be listening for that. And we can't be overcome with all the noise. All right? <clears throat> And sometimes we like to listen to the voices because they say what we want them to say. And that's, that's, a, that's a temptation that we have to overcome. The human side of us wants certain things. We want to see certain things. America has been so on board with my rights and what's good for America. And, and that's something that we, we tend to stray to, but God is saying, walk away from that. That is the kingdom of this world. Some Bible examples of people who, who were obedient to that small, still voice of the Lord. We know Abraham asked him to do something really incredible. I talked about this one time, I remember. You know, this was something that was hard for Abraham, but when you know the voice of the Lord, there's a peace that comes with it if you truly trust in the Lord. At any time that I've wrestled with something and I get... I, I hear his voice on that st subject, I'm not worried about it anymore. I, I know that this is what I'm supposed to do because God told me to do it, and I'm not going to worry about it. And Abraham was the same way. And sometimes it may be something hard. It may be something that goes against what all the voices are telling you to do. But God has given you this confirmation and this blessed assurance that this is what he wants you to do. We had Noah building an ark when it never rained on the earth before, something so totally bizarre. But he heard the voice of the Lord and he went with it. He obeyed it. He didn't question it. Everybody was scoffing at him. What are you doing, Noah? You know, but he stood alone, he and his family, and he built that ark and preserved the line to come that would be on the earth from that day forward after the flood. And then we had Paul, who was Saul, on the road to Damascus. God calls him out. He didn't question it. When he knew that that was the voice of the Lord, boom, he was obedient changed him right away. Uh, there was no you know, questioning it or fighting against it. He heard the voice of the Lord, and boom, his life was changed. And from then on, he preached the gospel. We had Daniel, who stood in the presence of the king, and he, he, he stood in obedience to what the Lord told him to do in terms of what he ate. God may give us direction on how to eat, what to do. God loves us, and he wants to give us the wisdom and the strategy, whatever it is we're walking through, he'll give you that strategy. You know, do this. This is going to protect you if you do this. And the, you know, um, and so Daniel heard the voice of the Lord, and that, that kept him in such good shape by eating a certain way. And he had favor in the eyes of the king and, and the court there because of it. And then Moses, another example, who heard the voice of the Lord many, many times through various means and obeyed the Lord. He walked in obedience. Yes, he had his hang-ups and, and, and <laughs> insecurities, but he followed and obeyed the Lord, and he knew the voice of the Lord. All right? And, and, and we may have those moments, too, where the Lord tells us to do something and we think we're inadequate, but uh, God gives us the power to do it. This month is Kislev. You know, I like to share the month, and this is the month to enter into a new level of trust and rest. It goes along with what God has been saying. And as I said before, when you are trusting in him, you can just rest and, and let him do it. We, you don't have to strive or you don't have to worry and be anxious. A month to declare your life experiences to be filled with tranquility and peace. Ask for the rivers of life to flow. And be cautious of who your support system is who are the influences in your life right now and who do you need to cut off because they're leading you astray who, what are the voices that you are listening to and like I said it may be it may be a, a prophet that you like to listen to a YouTube channel a doctor whatever it is 
But if they're not leading you in what God is telling you to do, then you have to shut them off. You have to close your ear to them. And this is the decade of the mouth. So many mouths speaking. Okay. Many prophets speaking. And we have to have the gift of discernment. This is God need, you need to ask God to up your level of discernment of what is truth and what is error because you can easily get caught up in what you think is truth and it leads you down the path where you're in error and you don't even realize it. All right. So I want to talk about prophets for a minute and what a prophet is. And one thing that's important about prophets that you should always recognize and, and want to see if you are listening to one is that they are involved in a group of prophets. They're not standalone. They're part of some sort of accountability. They're not just speaking without anybody giving them counsel. All right, so I'm, I'm part of the G-Force Ministries and we, every two weeks, we're having a meeting um, online. We also have a continuous group chat where people are, you know, giving feedback to one another and, and speaking things out. You can't stand alone, you can't be isolated because that's where error comes in, all right? You have to be someone who's accountable and part of a, a collaboration and a group of people speaking into your life and giving you feedback. Uh, so what is a prophet? It's someone who hears the heart of God and shares it, either with an individual, if it's pertaining to an individual, to the church, to the nations. Sometimes, sometimes it will include something that is to come, but not always. We can't always look to the prophets and say, what's going to happen in, in the next decade? What's going to you know? Um, but sometimes God does share that. But most of the time, God is just sharing his heart, what he wants to see in his people, what he wants to see come forth, how he feels about you, and providing some instruction. Here's a definition I found. Simply put, a prophet is someone chosen by God to speak for God. I often think of um, God as, or prophets as God's lawyer, someone who stands on his behalf and speaks on behalf of him, standing um, for him. Um, their job, whatever the time period or tidings, was to accurately impart his message. Men and women called to this task came from differing backgrounds, personalities, and levels of social status. But what they all had in common was a heart for God, an anointing to hear from him, and the faithfulness to impart his message to others. And what's important with that is the timing. Many times things are shared in the wrong timing. Things are shared... Uh, revelation is given to a prophet, and because they have a certain slant about them, the lens with which they are seeing and interpreting, maybe their dream, their vision, the revelation, um, is skewed because of the lens that they are perceiving it through. I'll, t I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, So the, the prophet must be disciplined to wait on God for when they should speak. Okay. 2 Peter 1.21, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's a human, obviously a human vessel, but God is speaking through them. And the prophetic word should not come from their will, but their will should be submitted to what God is saying, and they're speaking it forth. Yes, it will be tainted a little bit, not, not in error, but but the way it's delivered maybe by their personality, and that's okay. But the message is the same, okay? God told the uh, young Israelite nation he was to be their king, but the people clamored for a human king instead. We know this, right? God wanted to be the king over Israel, and they were like, no, we want someone, we want a leader, you know? So he put leaders in place, but he also provided prophets to advise those leaders to, so that his word could be clearly declared to the nations. All right, so some of those prophets, we all know, one of them, Isaiah. He was considered by most to be the greatest of the prophets. Uh, some would consider that. His ministry lasted through the reigns of five kings of Judah. And we know from Isaiah 6, 8, he said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. We know Isaiah saw visions of the of the throne room and the altar and the seraphim. So he saw visions. He heard clearly the voice of the Lord, and his obedience was on par. And then we had Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. 
because of his sorrow over the state of Judah. And he authored, we know, he authored two books in the Bible. Isaiah authored one. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. So he clearly heard the voice of the Lord. Ezekiel, a trained priest, he recorded clear and dramatic visions um, to the Israelites when they were in Babylonian captivity. And he heard the Lord say, Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. So again, God speaking through a person to his people. We have Jonah, who we always think of Jonah as the one swelled by the whale. He was disobedient. But he was a prophet of God, and he heard clearly uh, what the Lord was saying. I was, I was reminded of the Veggie Tales, Jonah. Has anybody seen the Veggie Tales <laughs> movie, Jonah? When Jonah was, our son Jonah was little, we took him to that movie. And, um, you know, it was Larry the Cucumber as Jonah. And he's walking through the town, and everybody's like, what's the word? Jonah, what's the word? Everybody wanting to hear from the prophet what the word was. And, um, and what we need to get away from is, what is God saying to me? What am I hearing the Lord say? not always looking for the prophet to tell me what to do or what's going to happen. Uh, so, so his problem was that he heard the word of the Lord, he didn't like it, and he didn't want to do it, <laughs> essentially, was Jonah's problem. Um, the word of the Lord, Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. God was calling him to a hard task, and he just didn't feel comfortable doing it. But it, uh, as we know, in the end, God got his attention and he did it, right? Uh, then, and another one we have is Malachi. Of course, there's more. These are just a few of them. The author of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi passionately confronted Jerusalem's population about the neglect of God's temple and their false worship. So here we see a prophet hearing from the word of God and really having to give some strong words to the people because of the way they were behaving. Uh, from Malachi 1.1, 1, 1, a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, a son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. So here the Lord is sharing his heart with Malachi on behalf of what's happening and how, he, you know, how he's feeling about it. So again, that share, God sharing his heart um, with him. So in the church, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 29, we know, and in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, and those with gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various tongues. And then in Ephesians 4, 11, again, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And what is their role? So what is the role of the prophet? Should be equipping the saints for works of service, building up the body of Christ, and bringing unity in the faith. All right? And notice in both of those scriptures, apostles and prophets are first. And that's kind of like the building block and the cornerstone of the church. We have to have those um, in place. And as a teacher, because I, you know, I, I'm not a teacher by trade, but I feel like God has given me the gift of teaching. You know, in, in Ephesians, the teachers are listed last, but in Corinthians, they're listed third. They move up in the, in the ranks. So teachers are very important, too. But I just had to say that as an aside. But my point is that the prophets play an important role in equipping the church and bringing unity in the faith. And so what we need to know is not everyone who calls himself a prophet may be truly hearing the voice of God or are interpreting the revelation correctly. Dreams, visions can be interpreted wrongly or spoken in wrong timing. And, you know, God is calling the prophets to be in season, that your word that you're speaking is pertinent to this season, as the sons of Issachar. They, they knew the signs and the seasons, the times and the seasons. And we know from 1 Corinthians 14, 29, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should what? Weigh carefully what is being said, right? 
Other versions use the words evaluate, discern, judge, decide whether what each person said is right or wrong. So we're not hearing it and taking it as gospel. We're taking the time to do these things, to evaluate, discern, judge, decide whether is right or wrong. And, and that is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of discernment. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have come out into the world. That was in Bible times, many. Many more have come out now. In 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. What does that mean? It's saying the Holy Spirit's not going to violate the will of the person. He will prompt you, but it's up to you to decide if you will respond to the, prophet, to the prompting. So if the prophet you know, is, is submitted to the Holy Spirit and will speak what the truth is, many people who are given the gift of prophecy, as with other gifts, get ahead of the Holy Spirit. We always have to be in line with the Holy Spirit um, when it comes to the gift of prophecy and as prophets. Jeremiah 23, 25, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. So even back then, we had prophets who were saying things that weren't from the Lord. Um, and Matthew 24, 11 says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Other versions will say they will lead many astray. They will lead them from the path of truth. They will fool them. They will mislead them. So I want to talk about a story in the Bible, 1 Kings 22, and it goes in verses 1 through 28. And this is the story of King Jehoshaphat and the prophet Micaiah. So I'm going to read some of it and talk about it and then read some of it. All right, so in the first few verses, it says, Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours? So that was a place. That was a portion of land but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people is your people, my horses is your horses. So there was a unity between Israel and Judah. And, and, and so Jehoshaphat is saying, you know, if you're gonna go fight, I'm gonna fight with you, I stand with you. And previously, the king of Syria had promised to return certain cities to Israel and hadn't done that. So here, you know, first glance at this, you think, well, why not? Why shouldn't we go get it? That's ours. They took it. They're supposed to return it. They didn't. So why wouldn't we go take it, right? Um, and it wasn't too, too far away. It was, it, I mean, for them, it's a journey. For us, it doesn't seem very far, 40 miles. So it was a place 40 miles from Jerusalem. So Jehoshaphat proposes that they seek God in the matter. So Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. So the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. Now this is 400 people, 400 prophets, and said to them, ask them the question, should I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight or shall I refrain? And they said, go up for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. So they're saying, you're going to have victory. You should do this, all 400. And Jehoshaphat had some discernment, and he's like, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Which leads you to believe he could sense that these prophets weren't speaking the word of the Lord. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, well, there is still one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. <laughs> because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. 
this guy has nothing good to say about me. I don't like him. And uh, Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Um, but the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah the son of Imlon quickly. And so there was the thought that he was in jail. The, the officer needed to go and get him. He was in jail. You know, he, he didn't like him that much that he was, he was in prison. So he's pulling him out of prison. So, um, so what happens here? So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne. So this was a, a thing that they would do. They'd sit at the city gates in their robes and have their council, and they'd ha you know, make decisions. So here they are at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were there prophesying before them. And Zedekiah, they, they specifically named this one, um, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And you know, the first thing I thought of with horns was the devil. <laughs> horns are, you know, it's a sign of the devil. Um, and so that, I immediately thought that when he, when he started to talk about horns. But anyway, uh, and all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So, the messenger goes to get Micaiah, and, and while he's getting him, he says to him, now listen, he's like giving him the scoop. Now listen, the word of the prophets with one accord, so all the prophets said this to the king, please let your word be like the word of them. So he's influencing him, like you need to say this, okay? Um, and Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered him. And this is interesting, because when I read the commentary on this, because I'm like, why did he say this? They're, they're saying that he, he was mocking what the other prophets had said. He was being sarcastic. Here's an example of sarcasm in the Bible. And he's saying, so what do you say, Micaiah? And he says, go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. You know, like he's mocking, like, this is what you want me to say, so I'm saying it, you know. And, but, the king, um, but the king knew that. So the king was sensed that because the, that's why the king then says, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he knew he was, he was not telling him what he really wanted to say. So he, then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd, and the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you? He wouldn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Didn't, didn't I tell you? There he goes. You know. And, and so, so Micaiah is speaking the truth. He's one person of 401 prophets standing there. He's the one who's hearing the voice of the Lord and speaking the truth. And this is interesting this piece right here, verses 19 through 23. Then Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. This is what he heard and saw. He's like, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab, the king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner, so they're conversing. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said, in what way? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. Can you believe that? And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do it. And therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, these 400 prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. I think it's important that we recognize this because it shows us God knew the whole time what was going on. In fact, he, he, he or, uh, kind of orchestrated it. Sometimes it's hard for us to say that when, when things like that happen. But the Lord was totally aware of what was going on. And so we know that when things like this happen, 
God is not being mocked. God is not being, you know, um, I can't think of the word, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, he's fully aware of what's going on. And it made me think of America. How could we not think of America when we read this story? Um, because we look at what happened with the election and all the, what all the prophets were saying. And how did they get it so wrong? And how do we not know that God allowed all that to happen to test you, to test me, to test his church? Who will you be faithful to? Will you be faithful to me or all these voices that say they are prophets and they are speaking into um, the political spirit? Political spirit. And when you're at a place where you think, well, I, I can discern. I know truth from error. I want you to think of Peter. Peter walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus. Peter had divine revelation that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when, when Jesus said to him, you're going to deceive me, or you're going to deny, deny me, he's like, no, I'm not. And then he did. So the minute they think you're not going to fall, you will. Pride comes before a fall, and it's pride that would, will, will make you think that you know without first hearing the voice of the Lord and constantly looking to the voice of the Lord for what is true. Isaiah 30, 10 says, Who say to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to what is right? Speak to us pleasant words, prophesy illusions. People want to hear what they want to hear. And so when the prophets line up with what they want to hear, they jump up and down and get excited. Right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I was in a place of that. I was in a place of kind of being a little skewed in my, how I was interpreting my dreams and visions because of the political spirit. And God allowed me to go through that, I think, so that I could give this message. So I could tell you that it's easy to be deceived. If you think you won't ever be deceived, it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are constantly in tune with the voice of God. Not with the voices that keep telling you this or that, and I gotta tune into this prophet or that prophet to see what they're gonna say next. I'm listening to them and what they're saying, but you're totally not listening to the voice of God the still, small voice, the sound of the kingdom. I had a, I'll tell you, my husband said to me, he's like, I've never seen you like that when I was going through this period of time where I was off track. I was so defensive, right? And I had a moment at work where I had an epiphany moment, an aha moment, like, I'm being deceived. Even this, all this sounds good. This is the enemy at work. The enemy will work on both ends and in between to draw you away from your purpose in the kingdom of God and will get you off track. And it could possibly lead other people astray in the meantime. So I say this as a warning to you to evaluate the voices that you are listening to and that you will hear the voice of the Lord. Is your trust in God or is it in the prophets? Are you hearing God for yourself or are you relying on what the prophets are saying? John 10, 4 says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. This is the shepherd and the sheep. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. If you are a sheep, if you are a son or daughter of Christ, then you should know his voice. And it's his voice and his voice alone that you should listen to. It doesn't mean you discount everything the prophets say. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to have discernment. And God will use the prophets to confirm things that God is doing in you. Um, the prophet's voice many times will be a, a source of conviction to you. Like, oh man, yeah. You know? God, is, God has been working on that with me, and now you're saying it too. And this is something I need to work on, or you know, whatever the case may be. We are in a season where we can't afford our minds to be clouded by what is not the voice of God. If you are his sheep, then you know his voice. Other voices 
you will not follow. And when we hear the voice of God and we clearly identify it, we can trust it. We can trust it. We can rest in it. And I want, to, I want us to be reminded of a um, prophetic word the Lord spoke through me on November 7th here. I heard the Lord say today to the church, don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Don't stop. And then I saw the picture of the donkey. You remember this? And I began to ask the Lord what the donkey meant. And he said, what you have perceived in your mind is what my will is for your life. What you think it should look like erase that out. Because when we think of Christ, we think he should, walk, he should be marching in on a white stallion into, uh, right down the, down the road into Jerusalem. And yet he was, walking, he was on a donkey. Doesn't, it's not what you would think. And we, what, we, what we have perceived in our mind, we have to dismiss and trust God for what he is going to do. So don't dismiss something as it's being not my will because it doesn't line up with how you think things should look like. I have your best interest in mind, so trust me with what I have for you. So I'm just imploring you today to be careful to know the will of God and allow him to guide us in it without any preconceived notions. And I was also reminded of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they trusted God into the furnace. They didn't fight against the king. They didn't, you know, plan a coup. They didn't speak ill of the king. They just spoke what the word the Lord in their hearts was to the king. And that is, you know, if it's the will of God, he will save us. And if not, we still stand strong in what we believe. And and we know the story. Jesus came into that fire with them and saved them. All right? Um, So ask yourself where you are today in knowing the voice of God. Are you dependent on hearing what others are saying, in order to make up your mind on decisions that you are facing. So I'm going to leave you with that. Pastor's going to come and and pray. Give you a lot to think about and chew on. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lori. Let's give her a hand this morning. That was a beautiful word. I want to add something to what she said, that along with hearing God's voice, uh, always forget, because I'm a teacher, that you have to read the scriptures always. And, and I'm sure you agree with that, Lori, that, that whatever you hear from God has to flow with the scriptures because if, if it doesn't, then something's wrong. Because I've, I've met people who said, well, I hear from God, but it didn't line up with the scriptures. And guess what? They didn't hear from God. They heard from somebody else <laughs> or something else. But there's always a flow with the word. There's always something that snaps into place when we hear God's voice and, and we see it in the word. It's amazing, really. It's incredible. That's why... Uh, one of the wise church fathers once said that the scriptures are for everybody for all times and in every situation. And that's how we have to read them. And it's, it's amazing to have something that given to us that has met the need of everyone through history. And in, in my office, I have a Bible from 1880. And I've shown it to some of you. And if you open it up, you go... The first thing I do when I see that, I, I look for notes, and I went to the back and I saw their devotional notes from 1880 in that Bible. And my first thought was, it got somebody through, and it says the same thing. Think about that. But I, I really appreciate what you're saying, Lori, because um, another scripture that came to me this week was, was Paul that talked about that he said, we're not peddlers of God's word, but we stand in his presence and hear what he has to say. In other words, there are peddlers out there that just kind of like Christianity is just a business and they just kind of peddle it and and it's all touchy-feely and feel good and, you know, they give you a word what you want to hear. But someone who hears God's voice will challenge you and you won't always feel comfortable. It, it It won't always feel bad, but it'll be true. It'll be true, like true north. And, and, and uh, so I want to uh, encourage, uh, seal that word in prayer. And if you're watching today or listening to this, know that you can hear God's voice. Uh, you don't have to be a, a, a prophet who has the office of prophet to hear God's voice. Everyone can hear God's voice. I talk to people in the market sometimes when we talk about God. I, I, I try to bring up God and, and I'll say something and they're like, oh, wow, my hairs are standing up. I feel, I mean, you know, what do you think that is? I, I believe that that's something in them that is, is 
the little pinprick of, of light of God coming out that he's given all human beings the ability to hear him and to feel him. So I want to pray into that. And especially in this season, uh, one thing I want to say too is that I believe that we're also, some of us are in a spiritual desert right now. Can you say amen, some of you, right? And maybe you don't feel anything. You don't feel God's presence. You don't, you don't hear his voice right now. And I want to encourage you with this word. Don't worry one bit. Because in the desert, that's the place where he gets our attention, where he weans us from everything else. And he kind of, you know, and um, th there's a saying that w when we're taking the test in the classroom, the teacher is always silent. So when you're being tested, God is silent. He doesn't say much. But there's a word coming. Be patient for it. Wait patiently for that word. It'll come in direction. So, Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you, God, for... Thank you that, that someone like, like that, the prophet that, that was mentioned, uh, Micaiah, I think it was, uh, this morning, that he, he was one that was willing to obey you no matter what and to deliver what you told him to say, even against a culture that's, that said the opposite that was acceptable and it was easy and, and everyone loved it. Lord, help us to be people who tell the truth, though not in an unkind way, but are willing to tell the truth that you tell us in a way that, that will be loving and in a way that will be honest and in a way that will be affirming, but yet true. And I pray that we will not be afraid to face that truth and that, that we would have, have no such thing as my truth, Lord, but your truth that we hear your truth, we hear your voice, we hear your heart. So this morning, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us in our deserts, in our lonely places, in our feelings of abandonment sometimes, in our feelings of tiredness, in our feelings of discouragement, in our feelings of what's going to happen next. Lord, we, we look for your word. We look, we look for you, Lord. Lord, as the deer pants for water, so does my, does my heart long for you, Lord. So, Lord, we look to you in those situations to give us a word, to tell us something as we wait for you in, the, in this season. So Lord, we speak blessing over everyone today. And if there's someone, Lord, who doesn't know you, who is watching today, we ask you, Lord, that they would look to you, Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith, and they would say, Jesus, come into my life and save me. I, I surrender myself to you. Forgive me of all my sins, O God, and, and, and transform me and forgive me and cleanse me, O God. Lord, I pray that you save someone today who is watching in the name of Jesus. We know that, that there are people who watch this who we don't know, and, and I, I've gotten sometimes texts or emails and, of people I don't even know. But Lord, I thank you that people watch. So we ask you, God, for someone who's watching today, we speak blessing over them. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace. So Lord, as, as we close this part of service, and afterwards we're going to end uh, and, and open for prayer if anyone wants prayer. But Lord, as we close this part of service, we thank you for your graciousness. In the name of Jesus, amen.